Kaya Chaksur Militanjena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhai Hevacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnavi Bhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Atvaita Gadata Shri Vasade Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So welcome to our Bhakti Shastri. We're studying Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7 to chapter 12. Today is lesson number five, qualities and behavior of a Maha, Mahatma. Okay, so we're not covering the whole chapter, but we're doing part of the chapter. <laughs> we're on the ninth chapter. We already began the first ten verses in the previous class. So today we want to look at texts 11 to 26. This ninth chapter is the very heart of the Bhagavad Gita, right in the center of the Bhagavad Gita. So it's a very important chapter. So we're taking more time to go through it. Recording in progress. So just some of the points which we want to cover today. We'll be speaking about Moga Karma and Moga Jnana based on Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, text number 12. And we want to see some examples of that. The, uh, then we'll also want to see how Krishna Bhakti can be easily performed based on Bhagavad Gita chapter 9, sloka number 26. We'll see how it can be very easily performed. And then we're going to talk about the qualities and behavior of Mahatmas. Oh, that's 13 to 14. And we want to see examples from Prabhupada Lila. Just a minute. We're having a very heavy wind, heavy storms here in Mayapur. Began last night. Very heavy wind and still here this morning. So I just had to lock the door, stop it from banging. Okay, so we were hearing in the previous section, remember ninth chapter. Who remembers how did the ninth chapter begin? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, can I try? Yes, please. Yeah, it began with a discussion of um, the most confidential knowledge in verse 1. Yes. And, uh, Guru Maharaj also spoke about the gradations of the confidential knowledge, beginning with Guyam, which is about, you know, the soul and the body, the beginning chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, moving on to more confidential knowledge, which is Guyataram, essentially chapter 7 and 8, which... Uh, discusses about devotional servings bringing enlightenment in Krishna consciousness. Uh -huh. And then finally, the most confidential knowledge, which is Guyatamam, which is essentially the relationship between Lord Krishna and his devotee, the transcendental dealings, which are very nicely explained in chapter number nine. Yeah. Yes, Guru. Navaraj Prabhu, you have to mute yourself. Yes, thank you, Prabhu. 
Yes, thank you for that, Prabhu. Very nice. Confidential knowledge, more confidential and most confidential knowledge was described, going to be described. We spoke about that and then we went on to speak about this Yogam Aishwaram, right? How Krishna relates with the material world. That was uh, text number four. The first three verses were glorifying transcendental knowledge. Then text number four brings us into this uh, Yoga Maishwara, the mystic opulences of Krishna, by which all beings are in Krishna, but not, but he is not in them. So we we spent we spent a little while considering these different points, how it appears almost contradictory. That Krishna says. And yet everything is not in me, All, everything rests in me, but it's not in me. Behold my mystic opulence, though I pervade and support the entire creation. All right. And the example was given. Krishna himself gave the example that uh, just like the mighty wind blows everywhere, but it always rests in the sky. So in the same way, all beings are in Krishna. So the mighty wind, I'm seeing a lot of mighty wind here in Mayapur today. So it's always within the sky. In the same way, everything is within Krishna. And then text number seven, Krishna says, uh, the end of the millennium, all material manifestations enter into him and at the beginning another millennium begins like this describing about creation the whole cosmic nature whole cosmic order is under me under my will automatically manifest again and again all right so nature of the material world that it continues. There's a creation, there's maintenance for some time, then there's destruction. And then after destruction, then again there will be creation. But Krishna says he's ever detached from all these material activities, seated as though neutral. And then text number 10, the material nature, this is a famous verse, text number 10, maya dyakshena prakriti suyate ta characharam hetuna nena kontiya jagad viparivartate. We often hear this verse quoted by Prabhupada, that the material nature moves under the direction of Lord Krishna. It's not independent. Hmm? So this was the main point of this verse. Material nature pr produces all moving and non-moving beings. Under its rule, this manifestation is created and annihilated again and again. Okay, so this was the first section which we covered in the ninth chapter. And here we have, we're talking about this Yogam Aishwaram, this mystic power of Krishna. So when Krishna has so much mystic power, we would ask, why doesn't everyone respect Krishna as the Supreme Person, that he's so great? Why is it not everyone surrenders and accepts him as God? So Krishna explains that there's different kinds of people, different ways in which they will respect Krishna. So texts 11 and 12 will go on to describe about the impersonalists. The impersonalists, they will see ultimately everything is one. And when they see Krishna, they say Krishna is also coming from that oneness, from the Brahman. Like that. This is the vision of the impersonalists. They think everything is one. There's only the oneness and that oneness is Brahman. And Krishna is the form of the Brahman. So these are the impersonalists. They see the, the Supreme as the Brahman, 
and then you have the pure devotees, they will be described in text 13 to 14. And then we have also the worshippers of the Vishwarup, which will be described in verses 16 up to 19. So you have three different kinds of people, right? You have the impersonalists, you have the Mahatmas, and you have the worshippers of the Vishwarup. But then there's others also, demigod worshippers. So they're also going to be described. And they're also thinking they're worshipping the Supreme. They think each, the demigod who they worship, they think that's the Supreme. Someone's a devotee of Lord Ganesh, someone's a devotee of Mother Durga, someone's a devotee of Lord Shiva, and they're thinking they're, they're, they're the Supreme. They think like that. So demigod worshippers are also mentioned. So demigod worshippers, that's in texts 20 up to 25, we'll hear about the demigod worshippers. So three different kinds of... Uh, people not, who are not pure devotees, right? You have the three different levels of knowledge. You have the impersonalists, you have the demigod worshippers, and the worshippers of the Vishwarupa. So which one is the best? And which one is the worst? Right? Who is the best? We are devotees, Mahatma. They're all devotees. Oh, you're a Maya body. <laughs> you say they're all one. Uh, no, they're not all one. It's not all the same. They're not all devotees. Well, they're not pure devotees. You could say they're devotees. Somebody's a devotee of Durga. Someone's a devotee of the Yubhishvarup. Someone's a devotee of this and that. You know, yeah, everyone's a devotee, you can say. It's a very liberal presentation, but actually we're speaking about pure devotees and these three people, three kinds, of, they're not pure, right? And there's different degrees of uh, righteousness or purity in their philosophy. So which one is better than the others? Which one is nearest to Krishna consciousness? of the three. Which one is nearest? The impersonalists or the demigod worshippers or the Vishwaru worshippers? Which one would you say is nearest to Krishna consciousness? Hare Krishna Maharaj, I think is the worshippers of the Vishwarupa. Yes, you're right. Very good. The worshippers of the Vishwarup. They're the nearest to Krishna consciousness. They're not offensive. You know, they're, they're actually close to Krishna. But in the, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, we actually see, it's described in the second canto especially. Second canto, first chapter, describes first steps in self-realization. And there Sukadeva Goswami mentions how we can worship the Lord through the Vishwarup. So that can be done. We can contemplate. We may not be able to, con to accept the Lord's divine form. We may not be so acceptable to worshipping deities, but we can see the Lord in the universe. We see the Lord through the universe, and we think of the, the universe as being the form of the Lord. And the higher planets are the top of the Lord, and the lower planets are the feet of the Lord. And the sun is the eye of the Lord, and the rivers are like the veins on the body of the Lord, and the mountains are like bones on the body of the Lord. And this way we see each and everything in the Vishwarup. The Brahmanas are the head, the Kshatriyas are the arm, the Vaishya the belly, the Sudra the leg. Like this, everything, everyone is there in the Vishwarup. And so some people contemplate God through the Vishwarup. And if they cultivate the mode of devotion, then they can go on to become devotees. Now, the, which one is the worst? Impersonalist. Why? 
they have uh, done done offense under the lotus feet of the krishna yeah. but they don't uh, believe uh, that uh, that is a personal form of the supreme personal god right now the impersonalists you see they also understand but not the body you know they are also transcendentalists they know but not the body but they don't recognize that there's a supreme personality of godhead they think ultimately oh, there's only one. So the impersonalists, they deny the supremacy of the Supreme Lord. They, they don't recognize any one Supreme Lord. They just say oh, only the oneness, only the Brahman. But they understand they're not the body. They're transcendentalists. They're free. They're detached from the material body. They give up sense gratification. Right? And then you have the demigod worshippers, people who, you know, they'll take some other form of their favorite demigod and they worship that as the supreme. So that the worshippers of the Vishwarup, they're first class, and the demigod worships are second class, and the impersonalists, they're third class. But the impersonalist one, that's the most common, that's the most prominent philosophy, impersonalism. And that's why we have Prabhupada's Pranam Mantra. Prabhupada gave us himself that Pranam Mantra, Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Desha Tarini. Preaching the message of Lord Chaitanya to defeat impersonalism and voidism. So th this uh, impersonal philosophy is very rampant, it's spread everywhere. And it's very offensive, it's against Krishna Consciousness. All right, so we're going to look at these point here we have, first of all, text number 11. There's two ones raised. Krishna Maharaj, Maharaj just uh, I wanted to understand one thing. Are the impersonalists and the Maya, uh, sorry, uh, Mayavati's uh, impersonalists and the uh, 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 Nirvishesha considered as impersonalists here? Or uh, some some difference is still there in this particular definition of impersonalist. Yes, impersonalist could be Mayavadi, but could also be Brahmagyani. Now, Brahmagyani is not offensive; they just accept the Brahman as truth. But the the Mayavadi, he actually denies the transcendental form of the Lord. The Brahmagyani doesn't deny it. Um, Maharaj, uh, how about the uh, uh, Shunyavadis, basically the, uh, the uh, Buddhists, they are also uh, part of this impersonalists or uh, they are different? Yeah, they are different. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Maharaj, I have one question. Actually, that the Shunyavadi void is, that is a Buddhist culture or somewhere else it is there? Generally, Shunyavadi is Buddhism. Okay, Maharaj. Thanks. <coughs> Only one question, Maharaj. Well, Vishwarup is also a material manifestation of the Lord Maharaj. Vishwarup. Yes, it's a material manifestation. Okay, Hare Krishna. It's a temporary material manifestation. And the whole purpose of worshipping the Vishwarup is that they have to develop the mood of devotional service. They have to recognize that there's a Supreme and that we're meant to be the servant of the Supreme. Otherwise, that worship is not going to be effective. You know, if we think, oh, I'm one with the Vishwarup, I'm one with God, I'm also God, then that's useless. There has to be the mood of service, to cultivate the mood of service. But here it is written, pure devotee, Mark Mas, whether it is Krishna Bhaktas or demigod worshippers, Maharaj. What? What do you say, Prabhu? Uh, yes, you, it is written as pure devotee, Mark Mas, it is written. Whether it is applicable to Krishna Bhaktas or demigod worshippers, Maharaj. A pure devotee, Mahatmas, they may be Krishna Bhaktas, they may also be Vishnu Bhaktas. Oh. 
Vishnu bhaktas can also be Mahatmas. Then was then was it Vishnu rupees? You told us first class devotee. Then how would this applicable Maras? Worshipper of Vishwarup, say of the three, of the three people, of, the three. of those these three who are not in pure Krishna consciousness. Oh, okay, okay. Of the three, the Vishwarupa is the better one. Okay, Maharaj, thank you. We're speaking about these, because not everybody be, respects Krishna, do they? But the, of course, the pure devotee Mahatmas, they respect Krishna. But these three kinds of people, they, you know, they, they have their own different philosophies, different understandings. Some are impersonalists, some worship the Vishwarup, and some worship demigods. Okay. So we're going to hear, first of all, about the impersonalists. Text number 11. Avajananti mam mudha manushim tanam ashritam param bhavam ajananto mama bhuta maheshwaram. Fools, fools, mudhas, they deride me when I descend in the human form. Manushya, right? They do not know my transcendental nature and my supreme dominion over all that be. My transcendental nature as the Supreme Lord. Okay, param bhavam ajananto, ajananto, mama bhuta maheshwaram. So like this, Lord Krishna condemns these people who cannot understand the Lord who is appearing in the human form. So they're described to be mudhas stupid rascals. They're thinking because the Lord appears in the human form, they think he must be human like us. And they think because he has a body like us, so they think he also takes birth, he also dies, he also gets old, he gets disease. They do not understand the transcendental nature of the form of the Lord. So, although the Lord Krishna performed so many wonderful activities, they still they could not recognize the nature of the Lord. And they thought him to be just like a, an ordinary human being. And so this is, you know, very offensive. It's not that God is made in the image of man, but we are made in the image of God. The original form of the Lord in the spiritual world is too armed. So we have appeared in this material world. We take on the form like the Lord. Because out we are competitors, we are envious of the Lord. So we come to this world to try to exploit and try to enjoy in this world. We take on this human form. And when the Lord comes, we think He's like us. We cannot distinguish His transcendental name. Even though He performs so many wonderful pastimes, still we thought, oh, it's just some magic, oh, it's just some trick, oh, He's got some power. They cannot understand that He is actually the Supreme Lord. People say, oh, if God is real, why can't we see Him? But 5,000 years ago, when Lord Krishna appeared in this world, there were many people who could not recognize Him. Only a few people could recognize Him as the Lord. Just like the Pandavas, they understood Krishna's identity. Queen Kunti, like that. So, the Lord covers Himself doesn't reveal himself to everyone. But actually he, is, he has a transcendental nature. Okay, and then 
here's a commentary by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Would someone like to read this, please? Hare Krishna. That well-known Mahapurusha lying on the Karana ocean with Satchit Ananda yes. spreading himself through millions of universes who creates the universe by his own energy is indeed you. But some say in depreciation that when you come as the son of Vasudeva with human-like form, it is just an amsa of that Mahapurusha. In response, the Lord speaks this verse. Yes, they deride this human-like form that I assume. They do not know that this human-like body is the supreme form, Param Bhavam. It is my Swarupa, my actual form more attractive than and superior to the Mahapurusha lying on the Karana ocean and other forms as well. What type of form is this? It is the highest truth, Buddha, meaning Brahman, and it is the Great Lord, Maheshwaram. The phrase Great Lord excludes other meanings of the word Buddha. According to the Amara Kosha, Buddha has various meanings such as truth, the elements like earth or being fit. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Yes. So here in the commentary, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is describing that it is Lord Krishna who is the original Supreme Lord. Now some people may think Mahavishnu. The Mahapurusha, who's laying in the Karana ocean, they may think he is the Supreme because everything is coming from him. But we should understand actually that form of the Mahapurusha, he is the Amsha of Lord Krishna. And it is Lord Krishna who is the original Supreme Lord. So some people, they worship Lord Vishnu as the Supreme Lord and they think Krishna is the eighth avatar of Vishnu. So Krishna is an avatar. But we say, no, Krishna is the original Supreme Lord and Lord Vishnu is his amsa. <laughs> Lord Vishnu comes from him. Okay. And then text number 12 describes the result of the impersonal philosophy, right? We thought if people think Krishna is an ordinary person, then what is the, what results do they get? What's the, the reactions from that? So it is described here in text number 12, right? Someone like to read text number 12? Um, Jagrati Patel Mataji, would you like to go first? Yes, Prabhu, Hare Krishna. Uh, those who are thus bewildered are attracted by demoniac and atheistic views. In that deluded condition, their hopes for liberation, their fruitive activities and their culture of knowledge are, are all defeated. Hare Krishna. Right. Lord Krishna speaks about Mogasha, Moga Karmano, Moga Jnana. So the attempts to cultivate uh, work and to cultivate knowledge will all be defeated. And what, and what will be the result? <laughs> they'll, become, they'll become rakshasas. They're, they're trying for something, but they don't get it, they don't achieve it. Their hopes for liberation, their hopes for fruit of activities and knowledge, all defeated. And, and because they're they're because they have atheistic and demoniac views. They don't understand the position of Lord Krishna. So that's demonic and atheistic. And because of that, the result is whatever they try to do, they'll, it will be a failure. Their endeavors, whether they try to enjoy this world or they try for liberation, they won't be successful. 
Here's a quote. Someone can read, or Maharaj, you can keep reading. Yes, Maharaj. What is the destination of those who do not accept you, Krishna, as the Lord, and think that you have a human material body? Even if devotees are in this condition, their aspirations are in vain, Mokasa. They do not achieve Salokya or whatever else they have desired. If they are karmis, they do not attain the desired results of their actions, such as Swarga, Moga, Karmana. If they are jnanis, they do not attain the results of knowledge, liberation, Moga, Jnana. Then what, to do, what do they attain? They assume the nature prakritim or of Rakshasa. Mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. Yes, all right. So they, they don't get liberation, <laughs> they don't go to heaven. What do they get? They get the nature of demons, rakshasas. So rakshasas, you know, not very pleasant people. Rakshasas. <laughs> so this is the result of their philosophy. They don't get any real benefit. They, they just get, they're put into this terrible condition of life to become rakshasas. All right. And he, Prabhupada gives another example here. This is about moga karmana, because we're talking about moga jnana, they, they're not successful in getting liberation. So, what about fruit of activities? Prabhupada here gives the example. Someone can read this for us? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, moga karmana means fruitless, baffled. Whatever they are doing, doing something, but at the end they will find it is frustration. They are not happy. Take for example, we have practical experience in India. Mahatma Gandhi, he was a great worker for national emancipation. But at the end, he was so much disgusted that I have seen personally, wherever he used to go, he used to plug his ears like this. Why? Now, wherever he would go, thousands of people would gather and will cry, Mahatma Gandhi ki jai. So the poor fellow could not sleep even. The very morning when he was, I mean to say, assassinated, he said to his secretary, I am so disgusted, I wish to die. You see, this very word was published in the paper. Now see, such a big worker, such a, simply a worker, but still he felt baffled. And what to speak of others? So moga, moga, karmana, unless we become Krishna conscious, then all our activities will be baffled at the end. Mm. 9.11, New York, so November 26th. Srila Prabhupada, in his early years, as a young man, he was a follower of Mahatma Gandhi. And when he first met Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, he was dressed in khadi. He was wearing always white khadi, khadi kurta, khadi dhoti. And he was a, a very follow, active follower of Mahatma Gandhi. But and when he met Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati, he expressed about the need for India to get independence. But Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati convinced him that politics was not as important as uh, spiritual politics. Spreading the message of Lord Chaitanya was more important than just simply independence for India. So Prabhupada gives this example about Mahatma Gandhi that he, he wanted so much to try to improve India, but he failed. He failed. He, 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 he didn't get any happiness himself from all of his efforts. What he dedicated his whole life for ended in vain. And there are many other examples of people like that. They de dedicate themselves to material endeavors. Ultimately, they're all defeated in the course of time. There was another man who, in Srila Prabhupada, 
respected, uh, he'd been the president of India, Dr. Radhakrishna. So Dr. Radhakrishna, he was, uh, he'd written a commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, but he'd made some, you know, very impersonal statements there in his commentary on Bhagavad Gita. And ultimately, he also died completely frustrated, uh, suffered from cerebral thrombosis and, you know, Prabhupada went to see him and Prabhupada was shocked at his condition, that physically and mentally he was completely destroyed. So, people endeavour for success in the material world or success on the spiritual platform in the sense that their goal is to get liberation. But if they have that impersonal, if they, if, if they don't understand properly the position of Lord Krishna, and if they're offensive to Krishna, then they will never be successful. They'll never get what they want. And they'll fall back to the material world. And we, we see uh, Example was there Subari Muni. Subari Muni was a great yogi. He was meditating in the bottom of the Yamuna River. But he was offensive to Garuda. And he got in big difficulties also. All his efforts were brought him a lot of trouble. So there are many examples. The path of uh, perfection. Unless we become Krishna conscious, then everything will be ruined at the end. We'll ne never be successful. People, impersonalists work very hard to liberate themselves from the material world and they may liberate themselves for some time from the material world, but then again they come back to the material world and take up welfare activities. And that we see common, so-called big spiritual people they're supposed to be liberated from the world and they come back and take up welfare activities or even go into politics and like this. Waste, waste their life. Politics is also useless, waste of life. So everything will be baffled at the end. So this is described here in these two verses. 11 and 12 of the ninth chapter describing the fate of the impersonalists and the result of the impersonal philosophy. Okay, then moving on to the Mahatmas, the next section, the next verses, here you can see the, the Mahatmas are described. Someone please read the Sanskrit and English. Hare Krishna. Mahatmanas to Maam Partha Daivim Pratrim Prakritim Ashritaha Bajanti Anyaya Manaso Yatva Bhutajim Avyaya O son of Partha, those who are not deluded, the great souls, are under the protection of the divine nature. They are fully engaged in devotional service because they know me as the Supreme Personality of Godhead original and inexhaustible. Thank, thank you, Mariji. Thank you. So, Lord Krishna directly mentions these people, Mahatmas, and he says, Daivi, Daivi Prakritim Ashrita. They're under the protection, they're under the shelter of Krishna's divine nature. So, this is different from the materialists. This is the divine nature, the devotees, because they're Mahatmas, so they're under the protection. Krishna protects them. Why? Why does Krishna protect them? Well, it's mentioned here, they're fully engaged in devotional service. Bhajanti, ananya manaso, ananya manaso. They're fully engaged without deviation in devotional service, and they know Krishna, they know Lord Krishna as the Supreme Lord, original and inexhaustible. This is the position, Mahatmas. Prabhupada was sometimes referred to all the devotees in ISKCON as Mahatmas. 
that you're all great souls because you're engaged in devotional service and you know Krishna is the Supreme Lord. So Krishna Consciousness Movement is a movement for Mahatmas. Of course, there are different levels of Mahatmas. They're great souls. And some souls are really great and others are not mediocre, others are maybe mediocre and maybe more of us are more on the lower level, just beginners. All right? But we've surrendered to Krishna and we give our full attention to Krishna. We try not to be diverted. We want to keep ourselves always busy in the service of Krishna. And we're convinced of Lord Krishna's position as the Supreme Personality of Godhead. We're convinced because we read Prabhupada's books and we hear from Prabhupada. So we're convinced. Right? Someone can read? Hmm. Yes? In this verse, the description of the Mahatma is clearly given. The first sign of the Mahatma is that he is already situated in the divine nature. The guidance of the spiritual nature is called Daivi Prakriti, divine nature. So when one is promoted in that way by surrendering to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one attains to the stage of the great soul, Mahatma. The Mahatma doesn't divert his attention to anything outside Krishna because he knows perfectly well that Krishna is the original Supreme Person, the cause of all causes. There is no doubt about it. Such a Mahatma, a great soul, develops through association with other Mahatmas, pure devotees. They are simply attracted by the two armed forms of Krishna. Hi Krishna. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, how to recognize the Mahatma? That, first of all, they're situated in the divine nature. And then here, it describes, what does this divine nature mean? It means they're under the guidance of the spiritual teachers, under the guidance of the spiritual authorities. They surrender to Krishna and Krishna's representative. This is important. We have no independence. In conditioned life and in liberated life, both sides we are controlled. In conditioned life, conditioned souls are controlled by the three modes of material nature. And in spiritual life, when we surrender to Krishna, then we're controlled by Krishna directly, or Krishna's representative. And the devotee is always busy in the service of Krishna. He has no doubt about Krishna. He's always busy, wants to serve Krishna. Okay? And then Prabhupada also adds here, they're simply attracted by the two-arm form of Krishna. Well, some people, they're more, they think because of oh, four arms, that must be greater than two arms. So some people think the Vishnu form must be greater than Krishna. Actually, the forearm form of Krishna, that is Vasudev Krishna. But we worship Shamsundar Krishna. The two-arm form is Shamsundar Krishna. Vasudev Krishna this is a forearm form. And there's the pastime, the gopi, Krishna was hiding from the gopis. So Krishna took a forearm form and the gopis came running and they saw the Lord in his forearm form and they offered their obeisances to him. And then they asked him, Did you, can you tell us where Lord Krishna went? And so Lord Krishna told them, oh, he's, he went that way. So the gopis went running after Krishna. So they offered their respect to the forearm form of Krishna. But their actual devotion, their actual love is for the two-arm form. All right? Another verse. This is a continuation describing the Mahatmas. 
right? We said, so recognize the Mahatmas. So, devotee, uh, who read that last verse? You can read this one also. Sakhi Mahajas. Satatam kirta yanto maam yata yatan tascha jrita vrata namash yantascha maam bhaktya nitya yukta upasate Always chanting my glories, endeavoring with great determination, bowing down before me, these great souls perpetually worship me with devotion. Hi. All right. So, always chanting satatam kirta yanto maam. They're chanting about Krishna and Drada Vrata. They've made this vow, determined vow, right? They make, they're, they're very determined, they're going to do it. Great determination that's required, right? Rupa Goswami also spoke about the importance of determination. So we have to be that, like that, we have to have this determination that we really want to do this for Krishna. Nitya Yukta Upashate, they're always worshipping Krishna. And how to worship Krishna? Namashyantascham, bowing down before him. Very simple, chanting, endeavouring. Here you can see, not, we're not impersonalists. The impersonalists, they don't understand the importance of chanting. They may chant, but they don't chant very much. They don't have taste for it because they are impersonalists. By their impersonalist tendency, they're denied the taste of the holy name. Yatantas, endeavouring, body, mind and words, endeavouring everything in the service of Krishna. Dridavrat, we're very strict, follow the rules and regulations, keep a courtesy. And Namashyantath, bow down, worship Krishna with devotion. Any ashram, Mahatmas can be in any ashram. Don't think Mahatma means, oh, must be in saffron, oh, should be a sannyasi or... No, all the devotees are Mahatmas, men and women. Grihastas, Brahmacharis, Vanaprastas, everyone. They can all be Mahatmas. They can all worship Krishna with devotion. All right? Here's some more about the Mahatma. Yes, please read. Who would like to read? The Mahatma cannot be manufactured by rubber stamping an ordinary man. His symptoms are described here. A Mahatma is always engaged in chanting the glories of the Supreme Lord Krishna, the personality of Godhead. He has no other business. The Mahatma is always engaged in different activities of devotional service. As described in the Srimad Bhagavatam, hearing and chanting about Vishnu, not a demigod or human being. Such a Mahatma has firm determination to achieve at the ultimate end the association of the Supreme Lord in any one of the five transcendental Rasas. To achieve that success, he engages all activities, mental, bodily and vocal, everything in the service of the Supreme Lord. Sri Krishna, this is called full Krishna consciousness. The Mahatma's great soul strictly observe all these rules and regulations and therefore they are sure to achieve the desired result. Thank you Prabhu. Yes. So you can see the description of the Mahatma from Prabhupada's purport. He's always engaged. He keeps himself active for the service of Krishna. Prabhupada talks about rubber stamping. <laughs> you can't rubber stamp someone. Oh, this person, no, he's a Mahatma. We don't just put a name. Somebody, if someone says Mahatma, Mahatmas, they will show it by their activities. Determined to keep themselves engaged, keep away from maya. All right? So, we want to hear from you now. Discuss qualities and behavior of a Mahatma. 
giving examples from Prabhupada's life. Yes? How many people do we have here today? Eighteen. How many? Eighteen. Eighteen. Oh, we are eighteen people. Sorry, sorry. Uh, nineteen, Guru Maharaj. Nineteen. nineteen. Okay, maybe we, what we could do, we could make little groups, and you could sit together and think about this for a little while. Can we have groups of like uh, four people? There'll be five groups. Okay, Guru Maharaj. Prabhuji, I'll just uh, handle the breakout rooms. Five breakout rooms. How much of time, Guru Maharaj? Five minutes. Okay. Just see what you can come up with.
okay? Yes, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, I think we can close the room now. Everyone back. There is some, some more to come, okay. Maharaj. Some of us have come back, but some are still in the rooms, Maharaj. Did you close the rooms? Amarni my Prabhu. I will tell Parmalachan Prabhu. He is the only who is doing, the, doing that, Maharaj. Who? Parmalachan Prabhu. Well, he should do it. Yeah, they are... Uh... They are coming back, Maharaj. They are coming back, Maharaj. Okay. They are coming back. Okay, thank you. Are they all being back in a few seconds? <laughs> all of us are back. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'd like to hear from a group, some spokesman from each group. They can tell us what examples did you come up with? So shall we start from group one and then next is two, three, four and five, Guru Maharaj? Okay. Who's the spokesman for group one? Satish Prabhu. Did they have some examples? Did you some did you pick up on some quality or behavior of Prabhupada? Yes, Maharaj. I'm also from group one, Hare Krishna Maharaj. All and right. in my group was Jagriti Mataji and Dayanidhi Prabhu. Yes, so, Mataji, please tell me. They asked me to write the notes, but I don't know whether I'm the spokesperson, but I will speak. In the qualities we discussed, the Srila Prabhupada was always engaged in a service of Sri, Sri Radha Krishna. He, in that way, he made so many temples and he made so many people, Mahatmas as well. And um, in, uh, also in Srila Prabhupada's unique quality was his ne he never felt his Guru's absence. And he was an expert spiritual master because he saw everyone with equal vision, Pandita Samadarshana. His face was always very effulgent and anyone sees him will feel like Krishna conscious. And in the behavior, we were also saying he was very broad-minded, very exemplary in behavior. He was always focused on Krishna consciousness and he would see anything, oh, he will serve uh, everything for Krishna. Anything he sees or he and meets people, he will engage them in Krishna consciousness, doesn't matter who they are. One morning walk, uh, Shri Prabhupada was going and he saw a donut shop and he commented, what they do not, in, in, what do they do now? They don't, uh, he, he all, he, they don't know any, um, uh, and they, he, he, donut, he took it as do not, do not do this, do not do that. So he always, um, uh, everything he cited or uh, he, he um, focused it on, on Krishna and he was very determined to spread the mission of Shri Chaitanya. 
how by his mercy the whole world is becoming Krishna conscious. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, Mataji. Nice. Interesting. Yes. <laughs> Another point I want to add, Maharaj, that he was fully determined. He was determined to spread the Krishna consciousness, the movement of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu all over the world. All right. Fully Yes, he took great risks and did, showed a lot of courage and determination to establish Krishna consciousness, to go to the West with no money, not knowing people. But Prabhupada took the risk and great efforts. Yes, thank you. Very nice. Yes, what about group two? Hare Krishna Maharaj, it was, we both uh, then uh, Priti Priyanka Mataji and uh, so, uh, as, as uh, mentioned in this uh, purport, uh, Mahatmas cannot be manufactured by the rubber stamp. So, uh, Prabhupada, uh, based, on, uh, based on what his Guru Maharaj had suggested, he, he was molded by his Guru Maharaj by certain instructions. And uh, uh, he, he was not a, a one who was just, uh, just came. He, need, he needed a person who got molded and that, that's how he became uh, what he is now, he was now, then. The there are, um, he, then he did the different activities of devotional service. He set a wonderful example for all of us that he had no other business other than doing devotional service. Right from early morning, he wakes up, he did the translations. He didn't waste any minute of his time in any other activity other than doing Krishna consciousness. So in that way, he set us a very nice example of doing the nine ways of bhakti in the most simple way, you know, always chanting the holy names of the Lord. And we even saw that he is very broad-minded. The perfect definition of Mahatma, he is very broad-minded. He accommodated everyone throughout the world, including the Westerners and uh, all parts of the world, including the women and the Shudras. He didn't discriminate anyone. So he included everyone in his... Uh, 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 he wanted to make everyone uh, disciples of Krishna. So and follows and yeah, follows uh, even Krishna. even after multiple fall downs also he uh, encouraged them to continue Krishna uh, consciousness. Yes, yes, true. So, yeah, I, I remember the example of this. Actually, he doesn't uh, approve divorce at all. But to one particular Mataji, he uh, said okay for divorce because later on when devotees asked him why, he would always say no to divorce. Why did you say? Then he said, I don't, I understood that she anyways was going to make the divorce. So I don't want her to do any offense to her guru by, you know, not following his instructions. So I gave her that uh, approval. So in that sense, he's so broad-minded. He's so accommodative to um, all devotees. <laughs> Okay, interesting. Yeah, an interesting pastime. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let's hear group number three. That's it's me, Amarani Maharaj. Uh, the qualities of devotees said he make others to engage in the devotion service, Maharaj. And since the proper uh, did that, he engaged everyone in the devotion service and the uh, he distributed books and he preached to, to every different countries and he uh, distributed prasadam. So in this way, he engaged all all the people in Krishna conscious uh, that is devotional service to the Supreme Lord. So that, that that is the best quality which is seen in the Prabhupada. And he also, in his behavior, set example to everyone. Uh, by, through his uh, Krishna conscious activity, Hare Krishna. Okay. And anything, anything who wants to add, we can add. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes. Uh, Maharaj. Yeah, Maharaj. Uh, one example, like uh, Prabhupada went to USA uh, when he was staying with the uh, hippies. He was not at all disturbed by their activities and uh, those things. Instead, he converted them to as a Vaishnavas. Like uh, wherever he go, he will make everyone as a Vaishnava or or. Uh, devotee of Krishna, like is having a quality in that way. Okay, thank you. All right, group four. Oh, Maharaj, one, one example I have to give in this regards, that is such as Prabhu is told. Uh, when Prabhu was traveling the boat, he saw a man and he was converted to, converted to Vaishnava. 
Yeah, that is uh, such a quality of uh, or the power of Srila Prabhupada, Hare Krishna. Okay, Hare Krishna. Group number four. Any spokesman there? Anything new to add? Okay, group number five. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. So, um, our group consisted um, Yashoda Mataji, Subhatra Mataji, Silavati Mataji, Renuka and myself. So, um, some of the points which um, the participants brought up was, number one, every word from Srila Prabhupada's lotus mouth was for the propagation of Krishna consciousness. All his activities were all directed towards devotional service and Krishna consciousness and he was he is an acharya where he's setting an example example strictly following the rules and regulations and he was walking the talks and everyone just had to follow what Srila Prabhupada was doing he was also always thinking of Lord Krishna and um, he was showering mercy to everyone because he really cared for for everyone he cared for every living entity and uh, you know in the western world especially he was continuously teaching everyone how to worship lord krishna in the deity form opulently dressing the deities doing abhishek you know following the archana principles etc and as what some of our other classmates brought up very very tolerant person so, Subhatra Mataji explained that uh, in Africa, you know, he was so tolerant, he did not even get angry when someone wrongly wore his clothes. You know, he, and what Satish Prabhu brought up, he was totally undisturbed by the surrounding. Um, and, and, and because of all the Mahatma potencies which or um, qualities which we have discussed, his legacy is actually increasing on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, thank you very much. Very nice. Nice to hear all of you glorify Srila Prabhupada. Uh, Maharaj, yes? this in, uh, yeah, there was in, when Srila Prabhupada came to Australia, he stayed very briefly in Australia in one of his visits and there was a very amazing prayer he offered to Shishirada Gopinath and he said that I am not capable of you know, transforming these uh, religious, you please take care of these uh, devo uh, devotees, you guide them so that they can worship you nicely. Some, such a beautiful prayer <laughs> he offered to the deity before he left. Because he was there for a very short time, Maharaj. Yes, right. Yes, uh, yeah, Prabhupada prayed like that to Lord Gopinath. Take care of him. <laughs> he brought the deity there. Think, you know, we think that, that when the deities come, we will take care of the deity. But Prabhupada prayed to Krishna to take care of them. So Prabhupada saw Krishna. He didn't see the deity. He saw essentially Krishna himself. We see the deity, but Prabhupada actually saw Krishna. So, many nice examples in Prabhupada's life. One time I remember uh, Prabhupada was sick, and so the devotee said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada, you're not well today, let one of us give class and you can rest. And Prabhupada said to him, he said, no, I have to give class. He said, if I don't give class, then you will think it's all right for you not to give class when you're sick. <laughs> In other words, you know, we'll make excuses. You oh, I'm not well today, I'm not going to give class, I'm not going to speak. But Prabhupada was, was so particular, so concerned, that even you're not well, still he wanted to give class. And that was his determination. All right, so we'll go ahead. Now, text number 15, an important verse. Anye begins Anye, right? Anye, who are the others? Anye meaning the others, text number 15, right? Jnana yagena chapi Anye, Jnana yagena chapi Anye, yajanto mam upasate, right? Lord Krishna is describing about these different kinds of people which I was speaking about the beginning of the class. 
ekatvena pritakvena bahuda vishvato mukam. So three different kinds of others are described. Actually, it's a progression. Prabhupada began, he said, after hearing about Mahat, after hearing about Mahatmas, then below the, on the level below the, Mahatmas are pure devotees, they're fully engaged in Krishna consciousness. And below that, you have four kinds of people who come to Krishna consciousness, who all have Sukriti, they have pious activities, right? So do you know those people? Who are those four kinds of people? What reasons do they come to Krishna conscious for? Distressed. Yes, so can you tell me in English the four reasons why they come? Distressed. Distressed. They seek out wealth. And wisdom and wisdom and knowledge. Searching for knowledge. All right. yeah, somebody comes in distress and someone else comes in search of wealth, someone else is curious and someone else comes with knowledge. Right? So those are all Sukriti, They're, they've come to Krishna consciousness. And then, but below that you have these three different kinds of people. The Ekat Vena, Pritak Vena, Bahuda Vishvatomukha. These are the, the others. So ekat vena refers to the monis or these uh, impersonalists or mayavadis. They worship the self as one with God. Uh, they are the lowest and they are the most predominant, most common, impersonalism, very common. And Prabhupada often said, he said, it may appear to be, you know, somebody's a, a Hindu, but he said, he said, when you scratch the surface, when you go a little below the surface, then you'll find this impersonalism. You'll find this ekat vena, this idea that it's ultimately it's all one. And so Prabhupada was, he saw this, Prabhupada saw this a lot in his own experience. He saw how much predominant, people may not be aware of it, but it's there, that tendency is there for us to be influenced because we've been brought up and it's been instilled to so many of us by so many uh, impersonalist gurus, d different speakers. So it's very prominent. But actually this is the third class. And then that Pritak Vena Bahuda, they concoct a form or they may worship their favorite demigod, they may invent their own form different ideas. And so that will be discussed, verses 20 to 25. And then the Vishvatomukam, worship the universal form. It's going to be described in sex 16, 17, 18, 19. Four verses will describe how we can see God in so many features of the material world. Vishvatomukam. Help us to contemplate everything in relation to God. So, text 15 is going to dis is describing these others, and we're going to see how these others are described. The worshippers of the universal form are described first. Text number uh, 16. 16, for example. In 16, Krishna describes, But it is I who am the ritual, I am sacrifice, the offering to the ancestors, the healing herb, the transcendental chant. I am butter and, and the fire and the offering. <laughs> and so Krishna is describing how he's there in everything. And this, this is the, for the worship of the universal form. It's like pantheistic philosophy, to see everything in the world in relation to God. Why don't they just have a small doubt? Yeah. Uh, in the previous uh, text 15, uh, 
uh, the Lord is saying that one without a second, as diverse and many, and in the universal form. I just want to understand what is diverse and many. <laughs> diverse and in many, yeah. Well, that's worship of the demigods, you see, that there are many different forms. Okay. There are many different forms, and the, the people will they will pick the the one they like. They will worship yeah. that one as the supreme. So diver, it's it's all Krishna. They're all formed. It's all everything is coming from Krishna, and so all the different forms of the demigods they're all coming from Krishna, and he appears in these different forms. So Krishna's. Krishna is diverse in the form of all of these different demigods. Now, if we, if there are ways in which we can worship the demigods properly, right? Yeah. What way? In what way can we worship the demigods properly so it doesn't obstruct our devotional service? Yeah, we do the sacrifice and uh, to the Krishna, so it ultimately reaches them also. Well, yeah, but I'm saying you can worship the demigods. You can worship the demigods. Depending their position, uh, uh, we can worship them. How? As devotees, we ask the demigods to guide us and help us to give more service to Lord Krishna and Radharani. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah. Uh, to serve Lord more. We should pray that we have to serve Lord more. Yeah, we have to understand that we shouldn't think of the demigods to be independent of Krishna. Worship them as the devotees of the Lord. They're in relation to the Lord, yes. They're dependent on the Lord. And they're, they, have, they have a particular service. They're holding up their positions, given by the Lord. Sorry, what did you say? Actually, Lord has given some official type of things to the demigods. Like Indra, he has to give the rain, like that type of things. I'm sorry, I'm not able to understand what you're saying, Prabhu. Actually, Supreme Personality Godhead has assigned some duties to the demigods to perform the certain type of duties. Yes, right. The they are given their areas of responsibility. So we should understand they are not independent of the Lord. And when we worship them, we worship them as being part of the Lord. You know? Not to do the second offense of the against the holiness. Yes. Yeah, we are not going to chant their names. All right. So this is a Pritakvena Bahuda, diverse in many. This is the worship of the demigods. Many forms, you know, 33 crore demigods, right? 33 crore, so, so many different forms are there. And they're all, it's all expansions of Lord Krishna's potency. So somebody may, some people become attracted by a particular demigod and they worship like that. And they think ultimately it's all one, it's all supreme. Okay, so indirect worshippers of Krishna, text 15. Prabhupada explains about this, text number 15, the Anye, the others. Prabhupada, this is from Prabhupada's lecture on this verse, this section. Now, those who are directly worshipping the Supreme Lord, Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, they have been described as Mahatma. And there are others, worshippers, they cannot conceive of the Supreme Personality of Godhead directly on account of being less advanced. Therefore, they have been described here, anye, others. So others, they worship the Absolute Truth in three different ways. 
the first class others. Among the others, there is first class, second class, third class. Right? Remember I spoke about this? The first class, they worship the universal form. Because that's close to coming to the truth. There's no offense, nothing wrong in that. The second class, they're worshipping the demigods, they're worshipping the devas. And the third class, the impersonalists, they're thinking oneness. All right? So, text 16 to 25, describing Krishna is the supreme object of worship. So 16, 17, 18, 19 will describe how we can see Krishna through the material world and the, relate to the universal form, the worshippers of the universal form. Uh, before, yeah, so that's up to text 19. And then text number 20, then we get text number 20, we're going to hear about the people who worship the demigods, right? Those who study the Vedas, drink the soma juice, seeking the heavenly planets, worship the worship me. Krishna said they worship me indirectly, <coughs> purified of sinful reactions. They take birth on the pious, heavenly planets. You see, this is the results of demigod worship. You worship the demigods, then you will go up to the higher planets. You can go up there to the higher planets. But what's the problem? Um, you'll come back. Yes, you'll come back. You go there, you stay there for some time, you use up your, your punya, your piety, and then you come back. You come back to earth. That's the results of the worship of the demigods, you see. So text 20, 21 is also describing like that, what happens about how you can elevate yourself to the higher planets. And then Krishna speaks this very important verse, a very powerful statement about how Krishna takes care. Because, you see, why do people worship the demigods? What's the reason? Why are they worshipping the demigods? For material benefit? To get to material gain. Yes, right. For their maintenance. People are worshipping demigods. Yeah, for their maintenance, for their material gain, benefit. They need things, you know, you need to live in the world, you need grains and so on. People worship, the farmers will worship the demigods, you know, they want to get a good harvest and like this. And so, yeah, for our own health and maintenance like that, we will worship the demigods. And this way we may go to higher plant. So, do we need to worship the demigods? We may think, oh, I need to worship the demigods, I also need to maintain. But no! Krishna said, you just worship me. Krishna said, I will take care of you. As Krishna says here, I carry what they lack. I preserve what they have. You don't have to worship the demigods if you're worshipping Krishna. Krishna will take care of all his devotees. Right? So, it's described here who Krishna takes care Maharaj, of. Maharaj, one question. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you have a question. So it could be in both material and spiritual sense, Maharaj, like material necessities as well as spiritual progression yes. towards him. Yes, can be, yes. Yes, definitely. Ma can, we, can we understand it this way also? Everything is spiritual, whether it is, uh, uh, we, we consider it as this material or spiritual, that distinction actually when it comes to Krishna consciousness, there is no distinction between material and spiritual, is that also right? Well, yes, if you're on that, you can come to that platform, you can see everything in relation to Krishna. Thank you. This is the best insurance policy, Guru Maharaj. Yeah, this is a good insurance policy, right? Invest in Krishna. Krishna takes care of everyone. All right, now you're going to worship Krishna, 
Yeah, there, there's some standards, you see, you have, what Krishna wants. And so Krishna is describing what his standard is. You, you want Krishna to maintain you, all right? So here's what Krishna wants. You worship him with exclusive devotion. All right? It's mentioned, ye jana paryupasate. Paryupasate means properly worship him. It's mentioned there, proper, properly worship. And then, then nidya biyuktanam, nidya biyuktanam, always live in devotion. Always live in devotion. So exclusive devotion. So Krishna has his standards, you see. Ananya, Ananya Bhakti is mentioning there also, Ananya Bhakti, so that's also important. That is uh, having no other object of interest, right? Chintayanto. Concentrate. I, I, this is for only those are surrendered souls at the lotus feet, fully surrendered. They don't depend on others only. Right. You have to be chaste, right? You should be chaste to Krishna. You shouldn't be thinking, oh, maybe I need to also do a, a, a Ganesh Puja. There's some difficulty. Oh, I need some money. Uh, maybe I should do a Lakshmi Puja. And I need to get Lakshmi's blessing. And my health is a problem. So I'll do a little bit for the sun god as well. No, we just simply depend on Krishna. And Krishna takes care of everything. So, ananyas chintayantumam yejana paryupasate tesham nidya biyuktanam yoga kshemam vaham yaham. This is a very, very powerful verse, very important verse. Yes. Because Krishna is promising that I will take care of my devotees. I will carry then and there's a story that maybe you've all heard that story about Arjuna Charya. Arjuna Puri. Arjuna Charya, he doubted that Krishna would take care. Yes, Maras. Yes, Maras. He thought Vahamiyaham, he thought no, he thought he thought Karomiyaham. He didn't think Vahamiyaham, he thought Karomiyaham. Krishna said, I preserve what they are. And so he changed it to Karomyaham. He said, I will get it done. <laughs> I will get somebody else to do. And so he changed it out. He thought, couldn't be Krishna personally coming to do it. And then what happened? Actually, he caught, uh, see what he got written in Bhagavad Gita, he, uh, he caught that Bahamyam, his daughter, Bahamyam, Paramyam. And Krishna himself uh, and uh, Krishna and Balaam both came uh, for his house. He brought all the things those who were needing. At that time, they saw their uh, back and also their tongue that has been caught and bitten. So yes, his, uh, right. <laughs> yeah, Krishna himself came with Lord Balaram and brought all the provisions. Arjuna Acharya had gone out begging, he hadn't got anything. But when he came home, he heard the two boys had came and brought everything. And, and, and they'd also complained that he'd beaten them. And of course, he'd, when he rubbed out this vahamiyaham, this was uh, like striking Krishna himself. So this is one of the important verses of the Bhagavad Gita, this one, along with, uh, there's a, the, the other verses that, also, verse number 14, number 14 is also a very important verse. Did you remember number 14? 14 was about the Mahatmas, right? Text 14. Satatam. Yes, right, Mahatmas. Right? So these verses are very significant. Krishna, Krishna promises, I carry what they lack and I preserve what they have. You don't have to worry about losing something. Whatever we have, 
Krishna will preserve it and if we're lacking something, Krishna will provide it. But we have to also meet our part, we have to do our part. We have to worship Krishna with exclusive devotion and we have to worship him properly. So this is nice, nice verse to quote, superiority of bhakti. You can read the verse, this purport from Vishwanath Chakravarti. On the other hand, the happiness of my Ananya Bhaktas is given by me. It is not obtained by pious acts. They are, all, they are at all times nitim, well versed in matters concerning me, abhi yuktanam, and they are always ignorant of all other things. Or the phrase can mean that they constantly desire to be in my association. For such persons, I take care of their attainment of wealth, yoga, and their maintenance, shema, though they do not expect such things. It would be unsuitable for, law, for the Lord simply to say that he performs this act. Thus the word Bahami meaning carry is used. The use of the word Bahami indicates that the Lord bears the burden of maintaining their bodies in the matter that the householder takes the responsibility for maintaining his own wife and children. Thus, one should not say that, like others, their attainment or preservation of bodily needs is due to karma. Hare Krishna. Ah. Some people may think that, oh well, it's my karma. <laughs> but for devotees who've surrendered to Krishna, it's not karma. The bodily needs are not taken care of by karma. It's taken care of by Krishna. Because they've taken shelter of Krishna. And Krishna takes the responsibility to do that. So we may wonder, is this a heavy burden for Lord Krishna to do this? Do you think it will be a heavy burden? <laughs> oh, how many people, no. oh, oh and, and, and now there's Hare Krishna movement, there's so many devotees, they're all coming to me to maintain them. How can I maintain everybody? No, we may think like that. We may think, oh, how could Krishna maintain so many people, so many devotees? Is it a heavy burden for Krishna? No, Guru Maharaj. Why? Why not? How He's not common at all. Capious. Because multiple Lakshmis are serving him. He is the, he is the owner of so many Lakshmis, so... As per given in the Brahma Sahita, many Lakshmis are just like uh, maid servant that are serving Lord. So mm -hmm. there is no chance to think that you will not be able to fulfill the desires of others. Mm -hmm. Okay. There are many Lakshmis serving the Lord. So you can tell the Lakshmis go and take care of the devotees, huh? Yes. No, no, no. He's full of opulence and uh, he's not, he, the first thing is he's not a common man. He cannot be compared to a common man at all. He's the Lord. Yes. An ordinary man. He's the Supreme Lord. If he desires, everything can happen, Maharaj. If he desires. <laughs> Just his desires, Maharaj. Okay. It's just uncalled. Okay, let's go on. Here's a bit more. Yes, someone... yes Maharaj, simply by his desire, the Lord can put everything happens by his simply will, desire. Oh, all right. Automatically. Let's have somebody keep reading. Maharaji, who was reading before? Keep reading. Snigdamai Mataji? Yes. Snigdamai Mataji. Still, since you are Atmaram, enjoying within and indifferent to all things as the Supreme Lord, where is the question of you bearing this responsibility? Because my Ananya devotee has no karma due to lack of desire, Naish Karmyam, his happiness is given by me. Though I am indifferent to all else, I have great affection for my devotee. 
This is the cause. One should also not say that in giving the burden of their maintenance to their worship, you Lord, the devotees show lack of prema. In fact, they do not give to me that burden. Rather, I, by my own will, accept it. It should also be understood that I am not bearing it as a duty. In the manner that I create and maintain the universe by my will alone, rather being attracted to my devotees, I take the greatest pleasure in taking care of their needs, like carrying the weights of one one's lover. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Vishwanath Chakravarti gives this example here, carrying the weight of one's lover. So. It's not a burden. And so the same way the Lord doesn't feel any burden to take the responsibility for his devotees. As you said, as one Mataji said, he's not an ordinary person. He's the Lord himself. And he's not, he's not doing it just as a duty, but, it, 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 but it, because he's so attached to the devotees. And he takes pleasure in it. You know, we may think, oh, it's just duty, I have to do this. Or sometimes the mother has to cook, I have to cook. But we want to do it out of love. And this is the mood of the Lord in relation to his devotees. It's a burden of, he has so much love for his devotees. Because the devotees have given everything to him. So the Lord wants to satisfy the devotees, to please the devotees. A little exercise for you. Experiences where Krishna carried what you lacked or preserved what you had. Discuss why it isn't a burden for Krishna to maintain his devotees. I think we did that last part, but maybe you could just spend a few minutes with a partner and just discuss about where Krishna carried what you lacked or preserved what you had. You have some, can you, can you take a few minutes, take five minutes just to discuss that? Okay, Guru Maharaj. So it's five minutes, is it Guru Maharaj? Yes, only. Okay, okay. Thank you. You are regrouping Prabhu? Pranilashan Prabhu? Yes, Prabhuji, one minute, yeah. Okay, please join your groups. I'm in which group, Prabhu? Pamelasan Prabhu?
Okay, Guru Maharaj, we are all progressively coming back. Okay, good. So, some would like to begin telling me something, what you discussed? Any, any experience of this where Krishna preserved yeah. what you had or liked? Yes, Maharaj. Yes. Um, so, in, in our small little group, um, Renuka mentioned that, you know, she always struggled to memorize verses, but when it's time for recording, somehow Krishna is so merciful, everything comes together because she, has, she claims to have an issue with memory. She, you know, so that's that's a that's a that's a big takeaway for her. And then uh, Yashoda Mataji, would you like to just share what you mentioned? Hi Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Um, yes, I was saying that Krishna brought to us our spiritual master. He brings to us our spiritual master, who gives us the lightning to come closer to Krishna. So Krishna brings what we lack, who brings to us the spiritual most. Oh, okay. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> mm, brought you spiritual teacher. Okay. Yes. Awesome. We'll, we'll just take one more. Someone, uh, someone else like to share? I'm Maharaj. This is Samarani Vajas from Group 1. Me and Daniel Prabhu are in the Group 1. And we are discussing about what we lack and what, where we improve like that. Actually, I was not good in English, but after coming to Iskand and reading Sri Prabhupada books, I was, I was quite able to uh, understand his special master and also able to, uh, able to improve in the English language. And also, I was, I was afraid of speaking to Lars in use group, group for special discussion. And I was able to do the special discussion to a large huge people and and uh, yeah, that's all Krishna. Okay, very good. Thank you, Prabhu. Yes, Krishna helps you to communicate. I have many experience, uh, but uh, one, uh, two things I want to tell that uh, one exam in the world exam uh, that uh, certified reliability engineering to qualify that exam is very tough. Only very few people they try to uh, clear. Out of 100, only 5 or 10 people they used to qualify the exam. I uh, just filled up the form for the exam, but I didn't get a chance to read and uh, I had not background to read that uh, course. Just I read only 10 days. But by mercy of uh, Krishna, I qualified that exam and become the topper. And uh, that is certified level in engineering. Wow. Another is during my job uh, life, I was in posted in uh, North India, I was not getting transport to my native place, Urisa. Uh, it took six years, but by mercy of when I prayed Krishna, then within uh, three months I got my transfer, my native place. No. Oh. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll go ahead. Let's see, here's text number 23, right? People were hearing about worship of the demigods, right? But, well, we heard, if you worship Krishna, he does everything, but what about other people? And so, those who are devotees of other gods, worship them with faith, they're actually worshipping Krishna. But they do so in a wrong way, right? Avidi purvakam. They're worshipping in the wrong way. The Yepi Anya Devata Bhakta. Anya Devata Bhakta. They're worshipping others. They're actually worshipping Krishna. But they do so in the wrong way when they worship the demigods. They're thinking, if they think these demigods are independent of Lord Krishna, then they're doing it in the wrong way. And then what is the result of that? And the result is that they'll come back again. They'll fall down. They'll come back to the material world. From the purport, text 23. One has to follow the laws made by the government not by the officers or directors. Similarly, everyone is to offer his worship to the Supreme Lord only. That will automatically satisfy the different officers and directors of the Lord. The officers and directors are engaged as representatives of the government, and to offer some bribe to the officers and directors is illegal. 
This is stated here as avidi purvakam. In other words, Krishna does not approve the unnecessary worship of the demigods. Right? The officers and directors, they are compared to the demigods. So Krishna doesn't improve, he does not approve of that kind of worship. That is the improper way, offering a bribe, we should understand. Worship demigods may be accepted if people know that these demigods are authorized agents of the Supreme Lord. There is acceptance of the Supreme Lord. But those fools who do not accept the Supreme God and misunderstand this particular type of demigod is all in all. Oh, they are doing nonsense. They are placing so many competitors of the Supreme Lord. That is avidi purvakam. That is illegal. Nobody can be competitor of the Supreme Lord. The Supreme Lord is known as Asamurva. Nobody is greater than the Supreme Lord. Nobody is equal. From Prabhupada's lecture on these verses in New York, 1966. So, yeah, you can worship the demigods, but do it in the proper way, that they're agents of Krishna, not that they're independent. And then the chapter goes on like this. This is text number what, 25. You worship the demigods, you go to the demigod planet, you go to the higher planets. You worship the forefathers, you go there. You worship the ghosts, you go there. And you worship Krishna, you will live with Krishna. So you understand, you go to the demigod planet, doesn't mean you stay there forever. You stay there for some time and then come back. We have to understand the nature of that worship. But if you go to Krishna, you can live there eternally. Yes, someone like to read for us? Um, Hare Krishna Maharaj. She is a prostitute. That's... Oh, sorry. That's all Krishna says. Yanti Deva Brata Devan. Bhagavad Gita 9.25. How you, how you nonsense say that everyone goes to God, but this is nonsense. You can go to the, go to Shiva. You can go to Indra. You can go. There are so many planets, and you go there, and that is responsible. And how, that is reasonable. And how do you say that whatever ticket I purchase? I go to this company. Therefore, they are nonsense, muda, rascals. They do not know what is God, what is yeah. demigod, what is God, Lord Shiva, what is Lord Vishnu or Brahma. They do not know. If a woman says, oh, everyone is my husband, then she is a prostitute. That's all. <laughs> so Prabhupada speaking strongly there to the audience in Hyderabad, 1976. Because that pe some people have the idea, it's all one, it's all the same. So is it possible, whatever ticket you purchase, every ticket will go to Delhi? No. The same way. If the woman says, everyone is my husband, how is it possible? Every man is their husband. So everything is individual. All right, so after speaking about the demigod worship, then we have this wonderful verse, very, another very important verse, number 26. And how Lord Krishna is describing, you know, why take so much trouble to worship the demigods? So many requirements, so many things are needed. Lord Krishna said, you can worship me very easily. He's asking very minimum, very basic items which are everywhere found. The leaf, the flower, the fruit, water, everywhere. Krishna is not greedy to get our fruits and flowers, but he wants our bhakti 
And that is mentioned twice. Huh? Twice Krishna speaks about the important, he wants our devotion. Yome bhaktya prayachati tadaham bhakti uparitam ashnami prayatatmanaha. Ashnami Krishna says, I accept, I eat it, <laughs> I accept it. And so this is a very nice verse, very pleasing to devotees. We all like this, oh, it's so easy to worship Krishna, we just have to give him fruits and flowers, and leaf, water, don't have to spend much money, it's very easy to worship Krishna. So it's attractive. But, of course, if we have more means, then we can offer more. And Krishna also, the Acharyas make the point in relation to this verse, that devotion means also our purity. That when we want to offer Krishna something, when we want to give something to Krishna, we must be pure, we must be clean, we, um, then we can properly offer to Krishna. Then Krishna will accept. If, if the person who cooked or the person who is offering, if he doesn't have knowledge of God, if he's not a devotee, then the devotee will be reluctant to eat that food. The person who cooked or the person who offered, they were not devotees. They had no knowledge of Godhead and they were not even clean and pure in their habits. Why should we accept what they offer? We should be careful. So Prabhupada lecturing on this verse, he said, How can one learn to love God? There are six kinds of reciprocation, six kinds of exchanges, right? Do you know these? Six kinds of exchanges? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. Yes, six kinds of exchanges, offering gifts in charity and accepting charitable gifts, offering prasadam and accepting prasadam, and inquiring confidentially and revealing one's mind in confidence. These are the six kinds of reciprocation or exchanges between one devotee and another. So we have to serve God in that way. Therefore, if you want to serve Him, start with some offering. Patram, pushpam. Anyone can offer a little flower, some fruit and a little water. So the Lord says, patram pushpam palam toyam, yome bhaktya prayachati. The important thing, the important thing is love. So we want to offer everything with the right mood, the loving mood. Cite examples from our scripture showing how the Lord is controlled by the love of his devotee. So there in the picture you can see one example, Mother Yashoda tying up Krishna, how Lord Krishna was controlled by Mother Yashoda's love. Can you think of any other examples? Any other examples where Krishna is controlled by the love of his devotee? Shabari. Shabari. I'm sorry, what was this? Gopis, Gopis. What? All Gopis. But they have bounded Krishna with their love. No, but you have to tell me how they bound Krishna with the love. What did, what happened? The dust from their feet Stealing, was used uh, to cure uh, Lord Krishna's head. And, uh, but, uh, from the well, that that wasn't controlling Krishna. Yeah. That was giving to Krishna. Krishna had the headache. That was curing Krishna. We want to know how Krishna is controlled by his devotees. Shabari, Shabari Maharaj, she was giving her uh, a juta or <coughs> the remnants of her uh, fruit. Actually, she was tasting it 
to make sure that it was uh, good enough for the lord but it was actually uh, her own uh, remnants but the lord accepted it because of her love Mm, yeah, but that, again, that's not, well, you could say it's controlling Krishna because usually we, we won't eat something if someone else has tasted it. We would, be, we would think, well, I'm not going to eat that. Someone else already had a bite out of it. <laughs> but Krishna is so kind, or Lord Rama was so kind, he accepted what was offered by Shabari. Mm. Uh, one, one more example. Hi, I Sorry, Prabhu. The cowherd boy is playing with Lord Sri Krishna and Mother Yashoda is calling Krishna, come back home and have dinner. Nan Baba is waiting and the cowherd boys are saying, friends are saying, Krishna, if you go now, we won't play with you. Krishna becomes frightened and goes back and plays with them again. Mm. Okay. So controlled by his friends. All right. I, don't, I never heard that pastime before. Uh, Maharaj, uh, uh, Lord Pandarinath, uh, he was standing on the uh, brick for such a long time that the devotee would come and uh, sir, uh, offer him whatever it is. So, uh, he was, uh, the devotee was serving the parents and uh, he asked him to wait outside. So, the Lord was waiting for him. Um, okay, this is Pandaranga, this is uh, the Maharashtrian deity. Maharaj, this Leela is in Krishna book. Really? Yes. Okay. Yes, all right. Yes, it's Sakshi Gopal Leela as well. Sakshi Gopal. Uh, Maharaj, you can look at it. Brother Arjuna is an example for binding Krishna with love. How? How did Arjuna bind Krishna with love? What happened? Because he was always with uh, Arjuna was always with Krishna and he was uh, dining together and he was sleeping together. So in this way he bind Krishna with his love. Oh, it's not a very good example of controlling Krishna. Maharaj, can it be that uh, Arjuna uh, controlled Krishna by asking Krishna to be the chariot driver and then he was giving direction by kicking him, go left, go right? Yes, yes, that's better, yeah. Krishna became the chariot driver of Arjuna, he became the servant of Arjuna, he took instructions from Arjuna. Bring my chariot into the middle of the battlefield. I want to see all the warriors who are assembled here to fight. So in this way, Krishna was taking orders from Arjuna. Mm -hmm. Raj, uh, uh, Krishna became the messenger of the Pandavas and he went to uh, you know, Hastinapur with the proposal. Yes, right. To... Yes, Krishna took the letter from Maharaj Yudhisthira to Dhritarashtra trying to prevent the Kurukshetra war. So he became the, the male man on behalf of the Pandavas. Mm -hmm. Because he can, he's controlled by the love of his devotees. All right. Yes, Shakshi Gopal, the witness deity, the witness deity, the devotee came and said, you have to come and be the witness. And the deity was saying, well, I can't, I, how, how I can come? I'm just a deity. But the devotee said, well, if you can talk, you can also walk. So Prabhupada said deity was defeated. So the deity walked. It became the witness for the man. So there are. And I said, I'd like to go and say that even Srila Prabhupada was able to do some, you know, control Krishna because of his pure love for Krishna. Well, you have to give me some example how Prabhupada could. Well, 
Uh, yeah, the the example was that you know the, which I had shared earlier in in Melbourne. Uh, they everyone was a newcomer, and Shila Prabhupada didn't have much time with them to guide them into Krishna consciousness. And it just yeah, but that's not Krishna. really showing us how Krishna is being controlled. That is Prabhupada's request to Krishna. Like, you know, Krishna. Yeah. Uh, what about um, Sri Advaita Acharya, you know, calling on the Lord to come just by offering Ganges water and Tulsi on the Shadigram? You know? So mm. the Lord was controlled by, by his requests and therefore the Lord appeared. Yes, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, he called the Lord to come, you have to come yourself. You have to come and deliver them. Okay. Anyway, Krishna does come under the control of the pure love of his devotees. Let's take uh, it off. Yes? An example can be how Krishna stole the, uh, the, the key for the sweet rice from Madhavendra Puri. When Madhavendra Puri was, was wanted to cook for his deity, he went to Gopinath Mandir and then Krishna stole the key. The sweet rice for him to keep aside. Yeah, Krishna, Krishna gave service to his devotee. That was without the desire of Madhavendra. Madhavendra Puri didn't ask Krishna to do that. He didn't. It's not like Krishna was controlled, but Krishna okay. did that because of his love for his devotee. Yeah, there was the Maharaj uh, where Jagannath is uh, actually not having any hair, but the Pujari was caught with the um, garland with the hair on it, and uh, the king wanted to know who it is. So he's requesting Jagannath, please, can you have, or he's not exactly requesting, but to save him, the Lord had hair for that past time, so he's been controlled. Okay, yes, certainly. It says, and there's a verse, Jita Jitopi Atitai Strilokya, that Krishna's Ajita is unconquered, but he's conquered by the pure love of his devotee. Yeah. All right. Oh, oh, oh we, we finished. That's the end of the slides. Because we're not doing the whole chapter, we can't finish the whole chapter today. There's uh, another section we'll finish tomorrow. All right. So we covered some different points today. Let's see what were the. Let's go back to the beginning of that slideshow. Mm. Oh. See what we 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 spoke about Mogasha Karma, Moga Jnana, right here. We spoke about these things. We gave the example Mahatma Gandhi, Moga Karma, that he tried to get so much peace, he wanted peace, he couldn't get peace. He ended up just wanting to die. And even the impersonalists, they want to get liberation, but they're not satisfied. Even if they get liberation, they come back to the material world and they take up bodily welfare activities. So this was based on 912, right? Who knows the verse 912? You know 911? 9-11, more famous. When I descend in the human form, and uh, they do not know my transcendental nature as the Supreme Lord. Very good. Yes, right. That's the verse. That's 9-11. So that is describing what kind of people? Uh, means, uh... Yeah, the impersonalist is being described. And then text 12, 912, goes on to describe the results of that impersonal philosophy. The result is, whatever they try to do, they'll fail. They try to get to enjoy the material world, they try for liberation, whatever they're trying for, they will not be successful. Right? Yes. And then we spoke 926, bhakti can be easily performed, offering a leaf, a flower, fruit, water, available everywhere, 
we can offer these things to Krishna. And well, of course Krishna wants our love. That's the main point, that when we make the offerings to Krishna, we want to offer with love and devotion. And then we spoke about the qualities and behavior of Mahatma. Examples from Prabhupada Lila. How Prabhupada kept himself always busy, chanting the holy name, writing his books, managing the society, giving instructions to devotees, showing them how to cook, and training them in Krishna consciousness, everything for Krishna. Cooking for Krishna, cleaning for Krishna. Sometimes devotees would be cleaning the floor. Prabhupada didn't like how they cleaned the floor. Prabhupada said, bring me a bucket, and he got down on his hands and knees, and he started to clean the floor himself. He wanted to show us how to clean the floor. <laughs> so, so many examples. Prabhupada taught by his own example how to be devotee of Krishna. So it's not just talking and not doing. Prabhupada chanted and he taught us to chant. Prabhupada wrote, read the books and he wants us to also read the books. Okay, so we've discussed these things today. We've been talking about the Mahatmas. All right, are there any questions? Anybody? All right, I have one question. Actually, you are uh, following that commentary of Vishwanath Chakra uh, Which book will, uh, you will tell, I guess, uh, I will try to read that. Oh, there's a, <coughs> he has his commentary on the, on the Bhagavad Gita. There's a book there, it's published. Banu Swami translated it. It's Banu Samaras. Huh? Banu Swami, yeah. Okay. That's a commentary. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur's commentary on Bhagavad Gita. He wrote his commentary on ba Baladeva Vijabhusan. He also has a commentary on Bhagavad Gita. Hmm. In one book, both commentaries are there by Banu Samaras. Uh, no, they're, they're separate books. Baladev and Vijabhusan and Vishwanath, two, two separate books. Prabhupada generally refers in his commentary, will refer to these acharyas. Okay. You can read also Barijan Prabhu's book, it's also good, Surrender Unto Me by Barijan. It's, that has also a lot of from Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. He took a lot of things from Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. Some things which are not there in Prabhupada's book. You know, Prabhupada said himself he wanted, to, he was going to write another Bhagavad Gita. And the devotees said, Prabhupada, you already wrote Bhagavad Prabhupada said, we already wrote Bhagavad Gita. But Prabhupada said, no, there's so many more things to say. So. At, at one point Prabhupada was thinking to write again, to do another Bhagavad Gita. He wanted to explain more. Okay, any other question? Okay, I'll see you tomorrow then. Thank you very His much. Holiness, His Holiness Bhakti Vikna Vinash Narasimha Maharaja Ki. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Jai.